Welcome to the Money Metals Midweek Memo, news and commentary relating to sound money, the precious metals markets, and the economy. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. So sometimes you got to play hurt, and uh, I'm dealing with probably allergies. This is the time of year in Florida we call the Great Pollinization, and so I've got the Sneezy, stuffy head, stopped up nose, scratchy throat. I got the, all of that going on, but got to do a podcast. I'm a hockey player. I play hurt, so here we are. We're going to try to to push our way through it, but if I sound funny, well, that's the reason why. So before we really get into the meat of the show, I want you to use your imagination for a moment. And I actually had, well, I didn't do it. My boss did it. He actually found an image that has this. It's a gun. So imagine just a standard revolver. But the barrel is actually pointed backwards. So like if you held the gun, if you actually pulled the trigger, it would end up shooting you probably in the chest. Um, Not the best gun, right? Not something that you would ever want to try to use, right? Uh, Downright dangerous. Well, that's basically what the United States is doing when it uses the dollar as a foreign policy tool. It's like it's using this weapon, but not considering that it might hurt itself if it actually pulls the trigger. And we may be seeing some of the impacts of that today. Now, if you've been listening to this show, if you're a regular listener, you probably follow the gold and silver market, so you know that both metals have gone on a nice little bull run over the last few days. It started last Friday when gold futures closed at a record high. Gold for April delivery rose by $41 on Friday. It was a 2% gain, and futures settled at $2,095 and 70 cents. That was a record close for the most actively traded contract. Gold futures hit an interday high last Friday of $2,096.40. That was below the all-time record of $2,152, which was set back on December 4th. Now, on the same day, Friday, the spot price of gold blew through the resistance level of $2,050 per ounce, pushed above $2,090 $2,090 and actually tested $2,100. The bull run continued on Monday with the spot price pushing above $2,100 an ounce and flirting with the all time record of $2,135, which was also set on December 4th. By midday yesterday, gold had actually set a new record for a spot price of $2,141. That was during intraday trading. So, what is driving gold higher? Well, the way I kind of describe it is that the yellow metal, and silver as well, uh, silver has also uh, had a strong run, pushed above $23. They're climbing a wall of hope. And the hope is that interest rate cuts will be coming sooner rather than later. There were a couple of bits of data that were released uh, last week that kind of lit the fire under this bull run. The first was on Thursday, the Bureau of Economic Analysis reported the January Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, which is shortened to PCE. Uh, It came in at 2.4% on an annual basis, and that was down from 2.6% the previous month. And then... Uh, Looking at the monthly numbers, PCE was up 0.3% and then core PCE rose by 0.4%. Now, those monthly numbers were actually hotter than the December readings, but didn't raise any real concern because they were in line with expectations. Now, what is PCE? Well, in a nutshell, it is the Federal Reserve's favorite price inflation indicator because it tends to understate price inflation the most. So that's that's a shock, right? The the Fed likes the number that makes inflation look the least problematic. Wow, who would have thought that? But the Fed loves some PCE. So with no surprises in the January report and that headline number settling close uh, close to the Fed's mythical two percent target, 
Uh, the report renewed hope that the central bank will start easing interest rates uh, earlier this year. And of course, we got a hotter than expected CPI data um, for February, and that had dashed hopes of the uh, Fed acting sooner, and that had driven gold lower to test the $2,000 an ounce level. So, um, that was one factor. Then on Friday, the Institute for Supply Management released its index of manufacturers. That plunged to 47.8% in February. That was down from 49.1% in January. And the consensus was for the ISM index to rise slightly to 49.5%. So that number was a big disappointment. And the unexpected drop in the ISM uh, reveals weakness in the economy, and that further stoked optimism about interest rate cuts. Then you mix some dollar weakness in there, and uh, that gave additional tailwinds for gold and silver on Friday. So you mix all of that together, and you had a nice recipe for a good, solid rise in the price of gold and silver. And this follows a pattern that we've seen over the last couple of years. Anytime we get any indication that price inflation is cooling or that the economy is weakening, this has been bullish for both gold and silver. And the hope is that victory over inflation is going to allow the Fed to cut interest rates. And since gold is a non-yielding asset, most people consider a higher interest rate environment like we have now a negative for gold. So rate cuts would be positive for gold. Now, I hate to throw cold water on the party, but the mainstream seems to be totally ignoring the reality of price inflation. Despite the PCE, price inflation is far from beaten. I mean, we can't just forget the CPI data that just came out a few weeks ago, right? I mean, we're so fixated on the latest data point that sometimes we can't, I mean, we can't see the big picture. We can't even see the medium-sized picture. And that CPI, the heating up of the CPI that we've been seeing really uh, for a couple of months, and then uh, if you look at the core, it's been stagnant, core CPI. It just doesn't tell you that price inflation is dead and gone, right? But this PCE number, that was enough to get the markets all excited again. You know, it's, it's the drug addict. They want the drug. The drug is easy money. So anytime that they get any sense that the Fed might be able to back off of this tightening, well, they're going to get excited. They think the party's going to rev up again. Now, of course, the other thing is, and I've talked about this on the show before, the Fed simply hasn't done enough to put inflation in its grave. Just go take a look at the Chicago Fed's own financial conditions index. It shows monetary policy is still historically loose. I mean, sure, it's tighter, but it ain't tight. And while a 5.5% interest rate is pretty darn high for an economy that is loaded up with as much debt as the economy is now, it is not high in the face of 6% CPI. And I say 6% rather than the 3% official number because an honest measure of the CPI would be at least twice what the government is telling us. So if you look at what I would consider to be a more honest CPI, interest rates, real interest rates, are still negative, And that doesn't do anything to stop price inflation. Nevertheless, almost everybody remains convinced that the Fed's got this. They remain con uh, confident that the Fed will give them back their easy money soon, and that's going to float the economy to the much-anticipated soft landing. Now, as I've been saying over and over on the show, I do think the Fed is going to cut interest rates. In fact, I think they're going to cut to zero. I think they'll relaunch quantitative easing. But it's not because I think they're about to enjoy a big victory over inflation. I think the economy is going to crack under the strain of so much debt and a 5.5% interest rate environment. And they're going to have to cut to rescue the economy because that's what the Fed does during a crisis and a recession. It cuts interest rates, it runs quantitative easing, it gives more easy money, and it tries to blow the bubble back up again. That's the fork the Fed knows. So that's how I see things playing out in the future. Now, they may cut rates a little bit before because they don't want to break the economy, and everybody's afraid. I think in everybody's heart of hearts, they know that 
There's a lot of debt out there, and they just can't let interest rates stay at this high level. So the Fed may cut. They're looking for an excuse to cut. I guarantee you that. But it's too late, right? The damage is done. In fact, the damage was done years ago when they cut rates the first time around, you know, back in the 2008 financial crisis. In fact, you could probably go back to the 1990s and say that's really where the Fed broke things. But um, the, the interest rate hikes are just a catalyst for the next bubble popping. Nevertheless, here we are. As one analyst told Reuters, the big reason here and they're talking about the price rally in gold and silver, is that we're seeing the market increasingly believe that a Fed rate cut is nearer rather than further away. So that's the mainstream narrative. Now, you know it's kind of funny, and I mean funny, sad, not funny, haha. The markets are desperate for the Fed to declare a win over inflation so it can go right back to the inflationary policies that caused prices to spike to begin with. Rising prices are a symptom of monetary inflation, and monetary inflation is exactly what we get when the central bank reverts to its looser monetary policy. So the whole mainstream thinking is kind of garbled up, right? But you know, there may be something more fundamental at play, kind of underlying kind of bubbling under the surface that is helping to drive gold higher. Economist Jim Rickards alluded to it in a tweet or a post on X or whatever I'm supposed to call it now. He basically thinks that the U.S.'s threat to seize Russian assets and give them to Ukraine might be driving or at least supporting this gold and silver bull run. And here's what he said in uh, what he tweeted or X'd. He said, nice rally in gold, new all-time highs. There are always multiple factors, that's true. But he said, I have no doubt a main driver is Biden's push to steal $300 billion in treasury notes from Russia. Once treasuries are unsafe, euro and yen notes don't look any better. Countries are going for gold, end quote. Now, what in the world is Rickards talking about? Well, he's talking about the weaponization of the dollar. And this is what I was driving at when I kind of gave you the little analogy of the gun barrel pointing back at the shooter. It's a weapon that is actually more dangerous for the person holding the weapon than it is the shooter. Now, as you know, the United States enjoys the privilege of issuing the world's reserve currency, but it increasingly uses that privilege as a hammer to shape foreign policy. Now, I've actually been talking about this issue for quite a long time. Um, I think it was three or maybe four years ago, I did a TV interview for RT America about the weaponization of the dollar. And this was way before the invasion of Ukraine, before RT was blacklisted. So this is something that I'm pretty, uh, pretty cognizant of and have been kind of following for quite a while. So let's dig into the possible ramifications here and maybe think a little more deeply about what Rickard said. So let's go back to when Russia invaded Ukraine. The U.S. and most other countries, primarily Western nations, levied sanctions on the Russians. Pretty typical response. America and her allies froze around $300 billion in Russian central bank assets. They also uh, froze a lot of assets of Russian oligarchs, Russian businesses. And then, not long after that, it took what I would call the nuclear option when it comes to economic warfare. It actually locked the Russians out of the SWIFT financial system. Now, what is SWIFT? That stands for Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, SWIFT. And this system serves as the global economy's superhighway, if you will. In effect, it operates as a global financial message service, and it facilitates cross-border payments. As the SWIFT website puts it, SWIFT is the way the world moves value. Now, the dollar serves as the world's reserve currency, and it is the primary mechanism in SWIFT, so SWIFT effectively facilitates an international dollar system. Now, after the invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. and its allies, as I said, quickly imposed economic sanctions, but they initially said they would not lock Russia out of SWIFT. 
But it was just a few days later that the United States, the EU, UK, Canada, they issued a joint statement announcing that SWIFT would disconnect selected Russian banks from the global payment system. Like I said, this is kind of a nuclear option because in effect it cuts Russia off from being able to do business around the world. Now there's talk of upping the ante even more. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen recently endorsed the idea of liquidating those frozen Russian assets and then giving them to Ukraine or using them to rebuild Ukraine. This is what Yellen said. She said, quote, It is necessary and urgent for our coalition to find a way to unlock the value of these immobilized assets to support Ukraine's continued resistance and long-term reconstruction. I believe there would be a strong international law, economic, and moral case for moving forward. This would be a decisive response to Russia's unprecedented threat to global stability. Now, there's also legislation that is moving through Congress right now that would authorize this. It's called the Rebuilding Economic Prosperity and Opportunity for Ukraine Act. And they call it REPO for short. I find this a tad amusing because I can picture a tow truck driver quickly hooking up a car in the dead of night in some dude's driveway and then, you know, squealing away with the car swinging behind it. You know, the repo man. Anyway, this bill would officially authorize the U.S. to seize assets held by the Central Bank of Russia and then give them away. Uh, from a Russian perspective, you'd probably say it would authorize the U.S. to steal Russian assets. Now, even if you think this is justifiable, as a foreign policy move. Russia deserves it. It's important to understand that the U.S. is playing with fire here and the rest of the world is watching. An AP report on Yellen's comments conceded that the strategy doesn't come without risk. Quote, there are trade-offs since the weaponization of global finance could harm the U.S. dollar's standing as the world's dominant currency. I think it's interesting that AP used this term weaponization because that's exactly what it is. And the AP is right. It's true. I mean, think about it. It would be one hell of a precedent, right, if a country can just seize another country's assets and give them to somebody else. Senator Jim Risch, he's a Republican from, Ohio, uh, from Idaho, he called the Repo Act, quote, a big hammer. He said, this is intended to be a big hammer. It's intended to be a very new way of attacking a country that does not behave itself. Now, using U.S. bonds as a foreign policy billy club could certainly incentivize other countries to behave, whatever that means. And of course, it means doing what the United States wants. But you'd have to be nuts not to realize that there might be some backlash from this, right? And it might make other countries nervous. Now, as I've mentioned, the, the U.S. using the dollar to kind of bully other countries into doing America's bidding, that's nothing new. And maybe bullying isn't the right word. It's more of a carrot and stick approach, right? The U.S. government will shower billions of dollars on foreign aid for its friends, but its enemies can have access to their own dollars cut off, just as Russia has learned. The fact that SWIFT uses dollars, again, as I've already explained, it means that the U.S. effectively controls global trade. That's a lot of power. And U.S. policymakers aren't shy about using it. And they've used it before. Go back to 2014, the Obama administration actually locked several Russian financial institutions out of SWIFT as relations between the two countries were deteriorating over Ukraine and Crimea. Uh, you know, again, that goes back 10 years. So this has been going on for a while. And then a few years later, the Trump administration actually threatened China in an attempt to force that country to join in sanctioning North Korea. And uh, this is what U.S. Secretary Treasury Steve Mnuchin said at the time. If China doesn't follow these sanctions, we will put additional sanctions on them and prevent them from accessing the U.S. and international dollar system. And he said that's quite meaningful. And I'm sorry for uh, butchering the former Treasury Secretary's last name there. Now, there is absolutely no doubt that economic sanctions like this can certainly advance foreign policy goals. Weaponizing the dollar can get other countries to do what we want them to do. But there is a big potential downside 
when the U.S. uses that economic privilege to bend other countries to its will. Because nobody wants to be bent, right? And we may think it's justified. Americans might think this is fine, but I'm sure the Russians aren't real thrilled with it. And that's exactly what Richard Rickards was getting at in his tweet. And he actually warned about this kind of move uh, almost a year ago during a uh, Fox interview back in April 2023. He said the biggest risk to the dollar isn't that other countries might move away from using the dollar in payments. He pointed out that the biggest threat to the dollar is the U.S. Treasury itself. He said the U.S. Treasury has weaponized the dollar, frozen the reserves of the Central Bank of Russia, and other countries are looking around saying, hey, what if they don't like what I did? What if they don't like one of my policies? Are they going to freeze my reserves? Valid question, right? And if you're holding something that could potentially be used against you, what would you do? You'd get rid of it and minimize that risk, right? After all, something you don't have can't be used against you. So if you're worried that somebody's going to use dollars as a weapon, well, you want to get rid of dollars and have something else. So in other words, if you are concerned that the U.S. might pull the dollar rug out from under you, why not pull out from the dollar system first? And that's exactly what's already happening. And if enough countries diversify away from the dollar, it could ultimately undermine the greenback's role as the world reserve currency. Now, of course, you would need to replace dollars and dollar-denominated assets with something else, right? As Rickard said in the post on X, if U.S. bonds aren't safe, other countries' bonds probably aren't safe either. I mean, you know, if you're holding yen, the Japanese could pull the yen rug out from under you. So that leaves one logical place to turn, according to Rickards. He said during this interview back in April 2023, he said, if you say, I want to get out of the dollar as a reserve currency, the only really good alternative is gold. And this is almost certainly one of the underlying reasons so many central banks, including China, are buying gold right now. You know, central bank gold buying has been on a record pace for the last two years. In 2022, it actually broke a record. And then in 2023, I think it fell maybe 43 tons short of that record. And China has been one of the biggest buyers of gold. I don't think that's an accident, given the way the U.S. has used the dollar. It's interesting, one country that's buying a lot of gold right now is Poland, which I think would be considered an ally to the United States. And when uh, Central Bank President Adam Glapinski announced an expansion of Polish gold reserves, he pointed out that it would increase the country's security and financial independence. And I think a lot of countries are thinking this way. He said gold will retain its value even when someone cuts off the power to the global financial system. Destroying traditional assets based on electronic accounting records. Of course, we do not assume this will happen, but as the saying goes, forewarned is always insured. You know what other country bought a whole heap of gold? and shed about 85% of its U.S. Treasuries back in 2018? Russia. So, kind of interesting. Russia was already prepared for this, right? The fact of the matter is, a lot of countries have been trying to minimize their exposure to dollars, and it's been going on for years. The Russians developed their own payment system several years ago before invading Ukraine. Last year, Indian Oil Corporation bought a million barrels of oil from Abu Dhabi's national oil company in a dollar-free transaction. And oil has been the, the, uh, the thing that circulates global oil trade. Saudi Arabia has indicated it is open to discussing trade in currencies other than the U.S. dollar. After Russia launched its war with Ukraine, IMF Managing Director Gita Gopinath, and I probably butchered her name too, uh, but she warned that aggressively sanctioning Russia could erode dollar dominance by encouraging smaller trading blocks using other currencies, BRICS. It seems her warning was prophetic. 
and American allies are even wary of the U.S. using the dollar as a billy club. After the Trump administration pulled the plug on the Iran nuclear deal, the EU announced the creation of a special payment channel in order to circumvent U.S. sanctions and allow trade with Iran to continue. I want to reiterate this. This is problematic whether you think sanctions are justified or not. I mean, you may think punishing Russia is fantastic, and that's fine. That's not the debate here. But you always have to be aware of the possible blowback. Now, you might be thinking, okay, so what? Some countries stop using dollars. What's the big deal? Well, de-dollarization, the dollar losing that reserve status would be a disaster for the U.S. and the U.S. economy. The dollar's status as the reserve currency indirectly supports the U.S. government's ability to borrow and spend. Because the dollar is the reserve currency, other countries need a lot of dollars. They need dollars to do business because business is done in dollars. Demand for dollars props up the greenback's value and somewhat shields Americans from the impact of its inflationary monetary policy. If the world didn't need dollars and the Federal Reserve kept pumping out dollars the way that it does, we would have hyperinflation. So the reserve status of the dollar keeps this whole thing running. A de-dollarization of the world economy would cause the value of the U.S. currency to crash, likely spark a currency crisis. It would further erode the purchasing power of the dollar, drive prices even higher. You could even see hyperinflation. In fact, I think if the dollar ceased to be the reserve currency, we would see hyperinflation. So we can debate the efficacy of economic sanctions, but it's always wise to be careful when you start pointing fingers or guns. You should always be aware of what's pointing back at you. Now, all of this has some application to you, dear listener. Here's a question. Should you maybe consider minimizing your own exposure to dollars? After all, the devaluation of the dollar is a risk to you and your wealth and your finances. Or maybe at least consider diversifying your wealth. Well, as Rickard said, the best option, and you could argue the only option, although there might be others, are gold and silver. And you can get gold and silver today. Even though we've had this kind of run up in price, I would still argue that both silver and gold are underpriced. Silver is especially underpriced given not only these financial and geopolitical factors, but also just supply and demand. So if you're interested, if you're thinking about this, Give Money Metals a call today. Talk to one of our precious metal specialists. You can just dial 800-800-1865. Or you can just go online. You can chat online. You can order gold and silver online over at moneymetals.com. Now's the time to do it because, you know, if you look at some of the charts, you, you talk to some of the analysts, we could be on the cusp of a big breakout for gold. If we're getting this kind of run-up now, just on speculation that the Fed might cut interest rates, what's going to happen when there is an actual economic crisis and the Fed goes to zero and relaunches quantitative easing? So give them a call today, 800-800-1865. I managed to make it through here without coughing myself to death, so that's a win. And we're going to call it a wrap while the getting out is good. So that is a wrap for this episode of Money Metals Midweek Memo. And you can get more information about the things that I've talked about today and a lot more over at moneymetals.com slash news. If you want to get the latest news right in your inbox, make sure you sign up for our email list. Of course, you can subscribe to the Midweek Memo on your favorite podcasting platform. Make sure you turn into our Market Wrap podcast every Friday where we wrap up things that are going on in the market. And really appreciate you listening to the show. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and I'll be back to talk to you again next week. 